Hey, what's up, guys? So, up next, we're going to talk about what went wrong with Kim Potter during that traffic stop. Now, as some of you guys know, okay, one of the shows I like a lot is Air Disasters. And they talk about human errors all the time. It's not something we can escape, you know, but that's why we have procedures. That's why we have uh, all these different things in place, you know, training and all this other stuff to help reduce errors. You know, but completely eliminating the possibility of all errors is a lot easier said than done, for sure. So, I'm going to play a clip from Air Disasters. And I think by the end of the clip, when I stop it, because I'm only going to play a few minutes of it. You know, we're talking maybe five minutes of the clip. Um, and I think by the time it finishes, you guys will probably understand where I'm going with this. Right? And to me, this is the only thing that could make sense. Or that she did it on purpose. She either did it on purpose... Or, it was this scenario that I'm fixing to show you guys. So, let's go ahead and check that out. Finally. After a painstaking data recovery process, investigators can finally listen to the cockpit voice recording from Garuda Flight 200. Fortunately, the recorder specialists at the laboratories are uh, a tenacious breed and they do not give up easily. But will the sounds captured in the cockpit shed light on the decisions and actions of the flight crew? Okay, let's hear it. Okay, when we're cleared, we approach runway nine, course 088. Investigators listen as the crew discusses their plans for landing. What you're doing is listening for the, the atmosphere and the tone, the ambience, if you like, in the cockpit. Approach flaps 40, auto brake 2, with air speed approximately 141 knots. On landing, parking stand to the left. Now they know they need 40 to land, but they only get five. What's going on? Approach briefing complete. Now, what he's talking about right there is the flap setting, okay? So he said they need 40 to land. That means they needed 40 degrees for the flaps for a proper landing. They only get 5 degrees. Okay? And they're getting ready to explain why. There's no sign the crew is worried. The captain certainly doesn't sound stressed. Then, the first hint that something is going wrong. Looks like we're not going to hit the glide slope. The plane is too high for this distance from the airport. Better get down a little faster. Now, the glide slope, that's what your plane locks onto, and then it automatically takes your plane in to the runway. So you don't have to do anything at that point. But you have to be lined up in order for your plane to lock on to that glide slope. So. Let's just keep going. I just try to explain a little bit. Because I know some of you guys might be watching this. And you're like well I don't know that much about. You know airplanes and aviation. That kind of stuff. So I'm trying to explain a little bit of this as we go. Y'all. <laughs> To land smoothly, planes need to lose enough speed and altitude to descend gradually and meet the runway at a shallow angle. 
Flight 200 is much too high. Okay. He's a bit behind, but it shouldn't be a problem yet. Stray compares the descent of Flight 200 with the flight path they should have been flying. It is not unusual to be a little behind in terms of slowing down and especially in terms of descending. And sometimes you find yourself high and fast and uh, you've got to make a decision. He definitely has some work to do if he hopes to get on track. Check speed, flaps 15. Flaps five. Captain is calling for flaps 15. Why is he saying flaps five? Flaps 15. Something is very wrong in this cockpit. Check speed, flaps 15. The captain repeatedly tells the first officer to increase the flaps to 15 degrees, but the first officer never moves them past five degrees. Flaps 15. It's like they're not even in the same cockpit. Landing demands precise crew coordination, but as they speed towards the runway, the captain and his first officer seem to be ignoring each other. There's a lot of evidence that this crew... Now, this is starting to get pretty interesting now, isn't it? Of course, you guys don't know exactly why yet, but you're probably already starting to see a little bit of the similarities here. Was but thinking it's getting ready to be perfectly aware they weren't communicating. Okay, first things first. Why did the first officer ignore the captain and leave the plane at flaps five? It's very perplexing. If you've got professional pilots, we can make mistakes, but usually that's why we've got two people up there so one catches the other. Investigators suspect the high speed at landing explains the first officer's decision not to increase the flap setting. Way too fast for flaps 15. Flaps can be damaged by excessive drag, and when the captain calls for flaps 15, the plane is speeding at over 250 miles an hour, much too fast to safely extend the flaps any further. Flaps 15. The plane is moving so quickly that wind drag could tear the flaps right off the wings if the flaps are extended past five degrees. I can very well understand why the first officer did not comply on uh, going to flaps 15. They're grossly overspeeding flaps five. Uh, the first officer was exactly right in not putting them down. All right, they were moving too fast to deploy the flaps. But why didn't the first officer say something? Tell the captain to slow down. One of the issues was that he, he didn't communicate his reasoning for uh, not responding to those uh, commands for flap 15. He didn't communicate that to the captain. When you take a pristine Monday morning quarterback look at this, regardless of airline, regardless of culture, it's very clear that the co-pilot should have said, Captain, I got the airplane. But what it tells me here is that this co-pilot did not feel that he could speak up one way or another. Even more bizarre, why didn't the captain react to the loud alarms sounding in the cockpit just moments before the first impact? Go around, Captain! Go around! Landing checklist completed, right? It's a tough one to ignore. There's nothing subtle about it. The ground proximity warning is a clear signal to a pilot that he's flying dangerously low. Well, there were 15 ground proximity uh, alerts and warnings during that final stage of the approach. When a crew member hears that, there should be instant action. Instead of aborting the landing, the captain does something that baffles investigators. Go around, Captain! Go around! Landing checklist completed, right? He asks the first officer if the landing checklist is complete. Landing checklist? I never heard anything like this. When the co-pilot called for the captain to go round and the captain responded, landing checklist complete, it was just something that we could not understand. I was appalled. This was industry worst practice for crew resource management. A pilot ignoring 15 warnings, ignoring two pleas by a co-pilot to go around. 
and landing 79 knots too fast. This was atrocious. For investigators, the question remains, why did the crew continue with the landing that was clearly heading for disaster? Personnel files reveal both Garuda pilots are fully licensed and certified. The captain in particular has many years of experience. But his dangerously fast landing attempt and the poor communication in the cockpit lead investigators to question the quality of the crew's training. So there was a much deeper uh, look at what training had been. So that right there is another similarity here, right? Because Kim Potter's training had been brought into question. What was her training? How well did she take in the training? You know, all that kind of stuff. But, let's just keep going. Provided We're almost the there, y'all. Weak situational awareness and coordination. Poor communication unstabilized approaches. A review of training records for the entire airline uncovers a disturbing detail. This is not the first Garuda crew to have problems with a routine landing. We noted that in 2001, an analysis had been conducted and there was a number of instances of unstabilized approaches or fast approaches. And you know what? There's another similarity that I just now realized. So here in the next few minutes, there's going to be quite a bit to cover. Cruise. The finding shines new light on what happened in Jakarta. Investigators may finally be zeroing in on the cause of the Garuda 200 disaster. Play that last bit again for me, would you please? Investigators believe Garuda's poor training record helps explain the deadly landing in Jogjakarta. High quality training for pilots is absolutely critical, especially when they face a crisis. It's one of the few things that can help a pilot avoid a strange psychological phenomenon known as fixation. Fixation is when we are focused on uh, completing a task to the exclusion of other things that may be going on around us. When you see people uh, as egregiously ignoring all the warnings and the systems and the bells and the airspeed and everything else here, you've got people who are fixated. Nothing was getting through to the sky. Investigators theorize that the captain was so fixed. Fixation or what I would call it is tunnel vision, okay? Now, when you get tunnel vision, right? The only thing you can focus on is achieving a specific task. In this case, it was, I have to land no matter what. You know, we can't go around, we can't do anything else because it's time to land and that's what we got to do. We got to make this happen. For Kim Potter, the fixation was he wants to get away and I can't let him do that because he needs to be arrested. Which is true. But you cannot fixate on that so much that it becomes something that you're fixated on. You, that does not work. You know, if all she had was a Uzi, she probably would have pulled that out and shot him with that. Because he can't get away. We have to stop him. You, don't get me wrong, she's still at fault. So her mix-up was part of this fixation. It was the pilot ignoring all the warnings and ignoring the co-pilot saying go around. 
that was her ignoring the feel of the gun that she had because she knew what the taser was supposed to feel like. She knew the taser was black and bright yellow and the one she had in her hand was completely black. And it weighed more. It weighed twice as much. You know... And what I've said before, she's also at fault for not making sure that car was shut off and the keys out of the ignition before they ever told him he was under arrest. I cannot imagine any scenario where a cop would feel comfortable doing that with the car still running. Does it make any sense, y'all? So as far as I'm concerned, they're all responsible for that car not being shut off and the keys out of the ignition. That would have taken that car out of the equation. That car could then not be re-engaged with all those cops standing there in order to keep that from happening. There's no way... He could have got back in, got the keys, put them in the ignition, turned it on, and put it in gear to take off with three cops on top of him, stopping him from doing that. You would have to have the quickest hands in the world to be able to do that. Okay? That's why it's so important for officers, before they're going to arrest somebody, to have that car shut off. It doesn't make any sense. You know, and not only that, they know there's no insurance on the car. So they know no one can drive that car home. It has to be towed. Right? So, why not get the car shut off? It's not going anywhere anyways. This was a colossal mistake. And it's just like the prosecutor said, just because someone is trying to get away does not give you the right to shoot them. It just doesn't. Now there might be some scenarios where it would be if you have reason to believe that that person would pose a threat to the officers or to somebody else. And that's the only way to minimize that threat, is to shoot that person. In that case, that would be justified. This was not. This was their mistake because the car was still running. They created that danger of having that car taken off. I really hope you guys can grasp this, okay? They did their jobs improperly. They were afraid of him getting away because that car was still running. And they know he's got a warrant for some kind of weapons charge or something. So why wouldn't they then say, okay, you know, we need to come up with a plan. So when we go up there, we need to make sure the car shut off. The keys are out of it. You know, get him out, walk him back to walk him in front of my squad car, and then we'll tell him he's under arrest. Whatever it takes, you need that. When you're doing an arrest warrant like that, and you know that person is probably going to resist, having a plan beforehand is crucial. Why didn't they have a plan? We're just going to go do this thing and that's it. And we're just going to go cuff him up. And that's all there is to it. You. It doesn't work that way. It's just like with this. With landing a plane. You do landing checklist. You know why? Because you have to. 
proceed, you have to visualize the whole thing in your head so you know at this point in time we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and then we're going to do that. Okay? That's why everything needs to go according to plan. And if it doesn't, then you know it's time to abort, go around, and come back again. Stated on descending to the proper altitude that he didn't notice his speed. And even when the alarm sounded, he failed to realize that his plane was in grave danger. It's hard to imagine how somebody could get to that point, but we have a lot of flaws. And part of the flaw in, in the case of a pilot fixating on a runway is that he or she can blank out the rest of the advice, the ground proximity warning system, everything. Training helps combat fixation by reinforcing standard procedures designed to ensure pilots can break the spell and take in the information they need. Oh, oh, go around, Captain. Go around. Oh, oh. Go around. Oh. Now, that right there was crucial, what they just said. Okay? Now, as far as her grabbing the wrong gun, think about what they just said. Going through training helps to combat fixation. Now, the state kept bringing up an important factor in this. And so far, a lot of people just kind of brushed it off like, oh, that's not that important. Her spark test. And I know as soon as I say that, a lot of you guys are probably going to get in the comments and say, hey, that's not that important. That was perfectly acceptable that she wasn't doing that every day. No. No, no, no. Let me tell you why. The SPART test has a couple of different purposes. The first one is it's pretty obvious. Make sure the thing works. Because it would really suck if you need to use it. But then you find out it doesn't work. That part's obvious. The other purpose is to every day have your hand on the thing. And do a spark test on it. So you get familiar with it. If I want to use my taser, I got to pull it from my left hand. Or I got to pull it from my right hand or wherever it's at. You get used to that. And then they'll say... Pull your taser. Then you pull your taser out. Right? Then you get used to that. Taser, left hand. Taser, right hand. You see? It builds up over time. And so, had she had been doing that those couple days prior, it just might have been possible that she would have realized, oh, wait a minute. The taser's on my left side. Because I just pulled it out this morning and did a spark test on it. Just think about it. If she had pulled it out, you know, that morning, which probably would have been no more than a few hours before that happened. You know... It's crazy. That's why it was so important for the state to keep bringing it up that she wasn't doing her spark tests. That's just like this on air disasters. If there's a pilot who doesn't do the checklist at all, well, guess what? Errors can happen then. And not just can, most definitely will. If you skip an entire checklist, it doesn't work that way. Think about it like this. Her spark test was in her checklist. That checklist was there to keep her safe. To keep her from endangering the lives of other people around her. She didn't do it, y'all. 
Landing checklist completed, right? Better training might also have helped the first officer overcome his reluctance to correct the captain's mistake. Without question, if the captain wasn't going to respond by going around, which is what he should have done instantly and hearing whoop whoop pull up, uh, the co-pilot should have said, I've got it, and done the same thing. All right, y'all, so look. This captain was still liable, in my opinion. Kim Potter is still liable, in my opinion. You know... And, and here's why I say that, okay? Because pilots are trained to overcome fixation. To listen to their co-pilot. To listen to what their plane is telling them. There's all these factors that goes into play here. You are not a one-man army. You cannot do everything yourself. So as far as Kim Potter goes... She was trained not to get tunnel vision, not to get fixated on specific things to the exclusion of all the other factors going on. That's what happened. Her only goal was we can't let him escape. Which, by itself, is fair enough. You don't want your, your bad guys to get away. But you can't get so fixated on that that you're ready to endanger the lives of everybody else in order to make that happen. Here's another example. You know, what if she saw a bad guy trying to get away would she start shooting at their car? Do you see what I'm saying now? You can't... There, there has to be rules and regulations for that. And... That's what the state's trying to prove right here. That you can't go... And do whatever the hell you want just because you're a cop. Alright, I will see y'all in the next video. Until then, I'm out.